Hey, and good morning to, uh, and welcome to Talking to Artists. We are at episode 62 today, and uh, very excited to talk to uh, Ramona Nordal, or Nordal, Nordal? I'm not sure. We'll have to figure out exactly how to pronounce her name. I think it's Nordal. Um, and she does mo the most remarkable stuff with, uh, with Bic Pen, so I'm really looking forward to kind of learning a bit more about, about what she's doing. Um, a few other things that are kind of on the go. You might have noticed I'm not as active on social media for the, next, the last week. The next couple of weeks, I've got my family here, so um, still around, but uh, just not spending quite as much time in the studio. And um, we are still waiting to see whether or not the Riverdale Art Walk can be in person or not. So hopefully stay tuned. If not, it'll be online. And then in September, there's a whole whack of stuff coming up. So if you are just craving the need to get out and see art in real life, just have to be patient for another month, and then I think we will definitely be in a position where uh, there will be lots of cool things to go and see. So I'm going to see whether or not Nordell is here, and here she is. And I'm her. I've admired uh, Ramona's work for a long time, so I'm really excited to talk to her and learn more about her inspiration. So, Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm trying to get a better view. <laughs> oh yeah, we can kind of see some of the Basquiat right now. Yeah, yeah, he's beautiful. Oh, thank you. So yeah, so um, just uh, I can totally hear you. You're doing well. Yep, and uh, want to thank you very much for joining me because it's uh, I've I think I first came across your work probably eight or nine years ago and uh, just really loved how distinctive and unusual it is. So I'm really excited to chat with you a little bit about it. Thank you. So I maybe you can maybe you can start with talking about I know you went to Emily Carr and you studied under uh, Dennis Burton, but maybe you can talk a little bit about your early influence and how you got to be where you yeah, are. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, when I graduated, um, I moved to Vancouver and started at Emily Carr and um, he was my teacher for both uh, my drawing class, uh, anatomy, drawing and painting. So he was, you know, he was pretty amazing at that time. He uh, pretty much let you do whatever you want. And he was very untraditional. He was very like, uh, he let you do, you know, what you felt you wanted to do rather than being that typical traditional, you know, teacher. Um, and I think it was really, um, a really a good thing because it, it makes you grow, I think, a little bit quicker than having a teacher who is um, so controlling. So, it was, yeah, it yeah. was an amazing time just to kind of have him influence me. Um, I was pretty naive and young and, you know, I had no idea what the world was about or, you know, anything about the art world. And, you know, it was it was a good learning experience for sure. Well, and I think that, too, I, I think we're probably about the same age. I think that kind of was typical, too, at that time, too. It's almost like the arts going to school for arts was very kind of um, insular like you learned what you were doing but and I know our teachers actually all had to be showing artists when I went to Western um, but I think in the four years I was there we only went to one opening really to be able to kind of see what was actually like and of course there's certainly never any conversation about how to actually run the business of art but I remember when I was graduating yeah. I was really excited to apply, right? Because of course, you know, I, the only thing in my mind was like continuing and going to art school. And I remember yeah. my graphic design teacher in grade 12, he, he was like, oh, you know, Emily Carr, it's really hard to get in there. And, you know, you're probably best to go to a school north, you know, north of here. It was in the interior of BC, right? And I, I didn't really understand why he would even suggest that. And I, you know, I was oblivious. So of course I applied um, saying, oh no, I'll, I'll get in, you know. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, very little um, help uh, in the high school itself. And um, it, it was really, it was unfortunate, you know, cause I think about all the arts, art students um, over the years that have wanted to explore, if not going to Emily Carr, going to OCAD or, you know, um, you yeah. know, schools in the States or something even. And I can't, I can't stress how important it is that those teachers um, really try and, and push them to do that, you know, because when I went to high well, school. Well, at least help encourage. Yeah. Yeah. I know I was told I could be a, a teacher or a nurse. 
And I'm like, well, first of all, I fainted at the sight of blood, so not a good choice. And I have no patience, so I would have been a really shitty teacher. But I kind of thought, really? Like, also, how come I can only be a nurse? How come I can't be a doctor? Like, it was just, it was so interesting that there were so many um, professions and stuff that you were kind of veered towards in high school. And I agree, like, the arts were kind of like, oh, so you're probably just going to get married and, you know, this will be something you'll dabble on the side as opposed to seriously looking at this as a potential viable career, which they should be. Yeah, I think, you know, I had three art classes in grade 12. And if I think the time spent, I think if I think about the amount of time that I spent in those classes, I could have learned so much about what to look forward to, you know, and, and the opportunities that are were out there. And, you know, but I mean, in hindsight, they, um, you know, they did the best that they could. And, but, uh, yeah, I was, I was glad to go to Emily Carr. Yeah. Um, you know, it served a purpose at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and obviously you found your way and you've done well, so <laughs> it hasn't hurt you in any way. Yeah, I've been fortunate and I've, you know, there was a time where I didn't paint for 10 years um, just for certain different reasons. Um, but you're always drawn back in and it's usually for a good yeah. reason. You're, you're definitely... Yeah, I think it's kind of... It's kind of part of your blood, isn't it? Like if you're going to, you've known since you were a kid, you're gonna, it was always going to be an important part of your life. You just don't, don't always know exactly how that's going to manifest itself. And I, you know, I think a lot of it, I was just really naive and young and I went to Emily Carr. And then after that, my friend and I, we moved to New York and, um, uh, you know, experienced lots there in the 10 years that I was there. And I was just really young and naive. I really can't express that enough. Um, and to become a full-time artist and, and um, take it seriously, you have to get to that point emotionally, I think, and uh, mm -hmm. time, you know. And so when did you, uh, when did you kind of, would you, would you have classified yourself as being a full-time artist? Uh, I think when I moved to Toronto, I, you know, I, I kind of woke up one day and I thought, you know, what are you doing? You know, you you've wasted all this time um, doing all these other things that interested you. But I woke, I literally woke up one day and I was like, oh my God, you know, and it was like lightning that like went through me. And from, from that day forward, I, that's all I could think of was to, to really focus on, um, you know, on, just continuing that that passion, I guess you could say. Um, and shortly after that, you know, I made the decision to come here. I didn't want to move back to New York, and I didn't want to stay in Vancouver because there's the art um, the art um, industry there is not um, not really uh, very big. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's definitely harder in Vancouver. And it seems, because my sister, you know, is in Vancouver too, it seems to be much more limited in terms of what it yeah. accepts as, you know. Yeah, and so, and so yeah, I, I came to Toronto in 2013. Um, I was painting, I guess, full-time probably since 2011. Um, but, uh, yeah, I moved here. I didn't know anyone. I had been here once before, and I just moved here and started, you know, doing it full-time, so... Well, that's brave. <laughs> <laughs> and so when did you, I love the fact that a Bic pen is a, is a really a critical part of your repertoire. And also I think it's kind of created such a unique look for you. How did that kind of come about from going to, from a doodling device to something that's actually a part of your mark making? Um, I, when I was growing up, my oldest brother, he was a huge influence on me. And I remember a conversation I had with him on how he drew with, with pen and I was like, wow, you know, I'd only ever drawn with pencil. And I remember he was such an influence because he was so skilled uh, with, with the pen. And um, I, I just always remember that. And I remember rather than pencil drawing in pen and it kind of evolved um, into working with painting as well, um, just because I like I like the look of the, the fine details of the pen. I also mm -hmm. like the contrast with, with painting. I find there's a, a contrast that really works there, so, yeah. 
And so like the one behind you, the blue uh, face, is that all done in pen or is that paint or is that a combination of the two? Yeah, for, for that one, not but <coughs> there's some where um, the pen is really quite evident in the face and I find it creates um, a very distinct softness. Uh, and then that um, with the actual painting, it's, um, there's that softness and um, that hardness as well with all of the, the graphics and the colors and of the acrylic paint. Um, yeah. yeah. And the color too. Like the color is very unique. Like it's very recognizable as your work, but it's also not a color you easily get with paint, yeah. I think. It's just quite unique. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> working with blue, the, the look of it is more than anything. I just like the the blue pen so yeah oh that's really cool I think it's kind of uh, it's really great that you're able to uh, do that I love to hear you know how different people somehow end up uh, kind of going down this path of using something that's unconventional and ends up working really yeah. well but I, I gather that's also kind of part of your kind of influence or your philosophy is kind of this old new traditional unconventional past present uh, kind of component do you want to talk about that uh, a bit? yeah um, I have a lot of friends they're you know they're very traditional painters. They know all the colors and the names and the percentages and, you know, it's very, they're very schooled in, in um, what to do, what not to do. And I don't really, uh, I don't work that way. I, if it looks good, I try it. Um, I, I certainly would never start a painting um, with uh, making sure I'm, you know, following you know, strict um, artistic protocol, you know, I think. Seems to suck kind of the fun yeah, out of it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I don't ever want to create work like that. And I don't ever want to make sure I'm mixing color properly. You know, I, uh, I, I just think that it kind of takes away from the process of whatever it is that you're working on. And I think if you are in tuned um, enough with what it is you're trying to convey, that if you actually follow through with that and what you think looks good, that it'll work out in the end. So. Yeah, I think we also kind of sometimes underestimate. It sounds like I'm kind of assuming since your brother was also um, an artist that you kind of come from a family that art was important and you probably were surrounded by yeah. art. And I think the other thing is that sometimes people – underestimated how much of that influence is so is um, organic you know you're surrounded by art so therefore you start to build a sense of what colors work and how things work mm -hmm. and it doesn't always necessarily need to be such so formally taught because I agree with you it's part of it's just playing and you know if it's working and you know if it's not working <laughs> I mean it's I I love color I love how it works from one color to the other and um that in itself, I absolutely, I love. Um, but I think you can get too caught up in the technical aspects of all of it, whether it be the materials or um, how you're actually creating something. Um, so I think it's super important to just really just go for it and, and try things. And you, I think you eventually find out what works for you and what you're comfortable with. So. Yeah. Yeah, I know for me, you know, I have a very, I do resin work and I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. And part of the reason I don't love it is because of exactly that. Like you have to be very technical and very specific and there's no real room for the way that I do it, creativity within the resin, I suppose I could be. Um, but then in the end, I'm like, oh, but I really love the way it looks. So I'm kind of <laughs> always torn. I figure it's probably good for the soul to have a bit of discipline. Uh, no, definitely. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, I think everyone knows what works for them. I think when you're doing something, yeah. you either like it or you don't. And um, yeah. if you're uncomfortable with something that you're working on, that doesn't necessarily, it's not going to turn out okay. It may be something new that you're trying, but um, yeah, it's just kind of dabbling in, in different styles and, and seeing what you, what you like, you know, not what you think mm -hmm. would do well or what what style uh is more appropriate um it's what you feel with and what, what you feel good about internally i think that's most important yeah well i think then it allows you to kind of continue to explore and refine um, a path yeah. right um you know 
like it's 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 one thing to kind of say oh well you're you always do portraits but it's like the portraits you do now are going to be different than the portraits you did five years ago sure. right because you're sort of modifying oh, and for stuff sure. um it's all a process i know? do it's one thing leads yeah. to the next 10 paintings from the first one you started it's going to be it'll be um different definitely yeah yeah Although I think sometimes the audience or the art collectors don't always see the difference, but as an artist, sometimes you're like, Oh, I can't believe that people don't see the difference in the transition and the evolution, you know? <laughs> yeah. It, uh, and I, you know, you always circle back to, to different things as well. I find that a lot. I find based on different um, uh, collections that I work on depends on my mood. You know, I have probably six different collections that I work on and over the past, you know, eight years, um, you, you circle back to, to different ones based on your mood and what you feel like doing. And, uh, but even yeah. those, you know, they, they evolve, they, they take on a different, different form as well to a degree. I agree. I work on a number of collections at the same time as well. And I do find that what ends up happening is that a collection I have left behind yeah. Um, I'll be doing something new and all of a sudden I kind of say oh, there's something I can actually go back to that original collection and kind of modify it or change it or there's something now that's influencing and I think that's kind of a I find it fun too because there's times when I feel like precision and there's times when I feel like just like slapping the paint on the canvas and just enjoying the color field of, of what I'm producing and it's nice to have some flexibility yeah, there no, for sure and so with your work too, it's obviously, it's very, it's very um, rooted in like a graphic concept with the outlining and like, for example, the one behind the bold graphic clean mm -hmm. color. Uh, did that sort of evolve gradually or have you always been kind of interested in this kind of softness of the face and the more line oriented uh, graphics? Um, I think that evolved definitely. I think um, over time I was using a lot of oranges for oranges and reds and then instead of um, creating a traditional highlight, <clears throat> I actually wanted to try more of a bold highlight. Uh, and I think that's where the lines started appearing. Um, so rather than that traditional highlight, whether it be, you know, on the side of a face or something, um, it just became more, more pronounced, you know, over painting to painting, and then eventually it turned into a line, you know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and the basket behind you he's like what 48 by 60 or yes, something yeah. right yeah yeah that's amazing <laughs> so what's the inspiration with uh with him he's just lovely i just he's amazing uh, um and i sorry go ahead no no i was gonna say what's his inspiration and and just to give a sense of i know you how long would it take to produce something like uh, that? that i know artists hate that yeah. question but i'm just curious no, it depends. it depends on how into it, I guess I am, you know. Um, but uh, I think for for this size, this size specifically, I I really want to do a series of people who have been influenced me. Um, maybe not so much even in their work, but maybe more so in their personality. I find I'm more attracted to artists based on the personality and who they were and where they came from, and obviously the work. <clears throat> comes becomes a factor as well but it's that personality it's kind of trying to capture their emotion you know not necessarily their work you know I find a lot of um, paintings uh, or portraits of Basquiat or you know any of the you know more famous artists I find they really try and replicate the artists um, uh, their style uh, but for me I really it's about that capturing that emotion of that person it's that's much more important to me and I I just find his story um, quite it's just quite interesting you know um, I did another one like this um, of Frida Kahlo and it was of her when she was probably about six or seven years old and um, I just love the idea of even though they're no longer with us, kind of bringing them into the future and letting them continue on with their story. Um, I, hmm. I think that that's really what I think about when I paint them or when I'm working on these pieces. And, um, you know, having them in my living room or 
you know, sitting down having a conversation with me and feeling how they would be today, you know, and conveying that in, in the work, um, whether it be them as a, a young kid or, you know, them as of today, um, kind of just continuing their inspiration and a uh, story, you know. But. Right. And do you, um, I mean, were you always attracted to Basquiat as an influence and therefore you decided to paint him or did you do sort of research and then the more you learned about him, the more you kind of were compelled to capture him? Um, I think it all started when I was in Emily Carr. I had a teacher who didn't really like me very much. And um, during <laughs> critiques, he basically singled me out of the class and asked me if I knew who Andy Warhol was. And I was like, uh, yeah, I do. And, but I felt really like, um, I felt like I was singled out as if I didn't know a lot, you know, and that I had no idea about, you know, the influencers in the art world. And he made me really question my, my knowledge, right? And so honestly, from that point on, I, I think I've watched over the years, every documentary you can possibly find on Basquiat, every documentary you can possibly find on Andy Warhol, all of them, you know, any documentary I can find, I'll watch it three and four times just because I, that knowledge of who they were, where they came from, what their work was like, who they um, hung around with. It's just so interesting to me. And, but I, I literally think that all stemmed from that teacher, you know, singling me out and asking me that question. But in the end, I felt awful that day, but it really helped me because it made me realize part of being an artist is you have to really, you know, learn, you know, you, you always need to learn whether it's about new artists or old artists or um, whatever it is, it's about that knowledge. Um, and that I think, I think that actually helps your work as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's also a kind of interesting point too, that sometimes those things in life that you go through and sort of with their art schooling and art and especially art is so personal. So it's hard to hear sometimes the hard things and the critical things. But then sometimes those things, once you get through them, you realize in hindsight, yeah, it did make me think about things differently. It did put me into a different path. And so although it was really horrible at the time, I was a little bit grateful that it and happened. Right? I, you know, um, I was very shy. And um, yeah, the fact that he did that to me was just like horrifying to me. But now I'm like, okay, I, I get it. You know, I'm, I'm glad he did, you know. Well, you're also more secure in your work now. Like, I think it's also hard when you're kind of not really necessarily haven't found your vision. You're a little insecure about what you're doing. And especially, I think some of the, there's a lot of benefit of having teachers that allow you to find your own path, but there's also a risk that you don't have the foundational skills to be able to find your own path. Right. And so they kind of hit you at a vulnerable yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. The, the times in your life when you're not, very satisfied with something that may have happened but you know years later how it actually influences you yeah mm -hmm. yeah i always say that to my kids like i know this is really horrible and tough right now but you're going to look back and you're going to realize it's been hopefully a good positive learning experience that hopefully you don't have to go through again but you learn from it at yeah, the time definitely so where did the um this the i know you're working right now on the color sessions so how did they is that that's obviously a new collection you're working on that's uh, much more monochromatic mm -hmm than you typically do from what yeah. I've seen. Um, I, I've always loved my earlier work, like much earlier work um, was uh, a, lot, a lot of texture, uh, very monochromatic, uh, statuesque, very, um, uh, very different from what I do now. And I think subconsciously, I just kind of went back to that, uh, maybe looking through old photos or but I really wanted to just, you know, try and um, get back to that and, and give myself almost like a little bit of a breather and allow myself to, to move forward um, in that style. And um, I just love the contrast of the textural um, hair or, you know, the, the, um, the color, the neon colors. Um, with the softness of the face. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I just wanted to explore that a little bit more and do larger pieces and just kind of go crazy, you know? <laughs> so 
What I really love about them, though, is that, uh, yeah, you can see the huge neon, and so that it's obviously a very strong, bright color, and yet somehow the overall painting feels uh, sort of dynamic, but also kind of tranquil, like it feels yeah, calming. Yeah, yeah. Which is pretty wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I just wanted to try it, you know, I wanted to t do some larger pieces and, and see how, uh, how they turned out, and um, yeah, I was pretty happy happy with the the results so um yeah i just continued mm -hmm. so that's another collection you're going to come back to and go and work through and <laughs> who's the next one in your collection of uh, artists influencer artists um oh, i have uh, an image of uh, a few images of truman capote as um he's a as a young boy and i was really thinking about doing him um, hmm. and i would like also to do wild but I'm not I'm not sure I have to really think about it because it'll be another big one like Basquiat um, and then there's a young uh, a photo of um, David Bowie when he was probably maybe five and it's I think that would be quite amazing um, to do him just to see how many people would recognize him as a young boy you know but have, right I think just drawing out who he became in that painting would be kind of uh, interesting just to, to try it. So we'll see. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, that'd be really, that's cool. It's interesting that you, um, that you're painting the portrait of before they became who they mm -hmm. became, but to kind of see the influencers and the markers that potentially were already in place, yeah. right? To, for it to lead to that, that greatness or that Yeah, influence. no, I find it interesting looking at them when they were kids um, or when they're younger. Because um, you wonder what went on in their mind, you know. Did they know have mm -hmm. these ideas of, uh, you know, these artistic ideas, and um, uh, you know, had they, you know, grown up knowing that this would happen to them? And I always think about that, um, whether it's artists or you know anyone um, who becomes famous, uh, just seeing them as a younger. Uh, person, it kind of puts it puts it in perspective that they are just a person. They may be, a, mm -hmm. you know, a crazy icon um, or completely famous. But you know, when you see them as a child, I think that um, they become more real, and uh, I think that's kind of an interesting thing to capture on campus. Yeah, it's also kind of interesting too to sort of uh, reinforce that message too that you can't prejudge what people are going to become, right? I mean, there's opportunities and there's options for people when they're really young and their life was unformed yet. And so to sort of write them off or think that they're going to go one way when they go the other way, it's like there's still that so much, I guess, un un unknown really at that age, right? And so I think it's a good lesson for all of us to kind of remember too, that sometimes it's those unusual quirky people that think differently than end up really changing yeah. the world. No, definitely. Um... Yeah, it's it's just my interest. I I'm just very interested in in the process that an artist goes through from um, when they're young to when they actually become quite you know quite famous. That process of you know the emotions that they go through and uh, how it evolves, basically. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like you've done a fair amount of traveling, kind of in your life, either moving or. Uh, so has that sort of, how does that influence your work? Or is that just something you enjoy doing? Yeah, I don't ever, ever want to move anymore, ever again. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously not necessarily a positive experience. <laughs> like, back to New York, and I'm like, no, no, I'm quite happy here. I can always go there. And um, I think that, yeah, I'm really comfortable in Toronto. But moving, moving, I think, you know, it kind of makes you appreciate having a home, you know, it makes you appreciate being in a, an environment that you feel safe in and comfortable in um, some place where you can actually work, you know. Um, I think traveling, you know, I've, I've lived in quite a few different places. I've lived in Germany and the Caribbean and New York and, but um, yeah, I think kind of opens your eyes, but it makes you appreciate where you land. You know, the place where you actually uh -huh. land eventually, it, it makes you appreciate that a lot.
The traveling and everything. I think it, it's yeah. where you land. I think it also makes you really cherish um, your kind of foundational relationships and friendships. And those only happen over years of, of kind of common experiences, which if you're moving all the time is hard to, hard to oh, get. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think by moving a lot and leaving friends behind and leaving family behind, I think you definitely alienate yourself to a certain degree. Um, like throughout the pandemic, I've been quite satisfied not seeing people, you know, I, I have absolutely no problem with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think by traveling, you, you know, you lose touch with people and you keep a close group of friends um, that remain consistent. But um, I think you're on your own a lot. And uh, so I think me, as I've, you know, come to 2021 um been going through the pandemic and i think that yeah i think that um it's it's nice just to have a home now and and feel comfortable where you are yeah mm -hmm. and i think you know i say this often but i do think that you know we're really blessed in toronto too to have a really large diverse supportive artist community which is also pretty wonderful yeah, yeah. Like I think it's, uh, you definitely feel like there's nothing better than going to the artist project and being surrounded by all your friends again after, you know, this, especially this year, it'll be after a couple of yeah, years. I'm you know? actually kind of curious what they plan on doing with that, but um, sorry, I'm almost like yeah. totally fogging up because it's so humid in here. <laughs> I'm gonna try. <laughs> it's freezing here. I'm at the cottage and it's cold this morning. I'm wearing like a sweater. <laughs> it's super, super humid here. So that's why my phone is fogging up. Um, but... <laughs> Yeah, I'm interested to see uh, if the Artist Project uh, opens up this coming year. Uh, it's always fun to do that. I didn't do it last, the last time that they had it. Um, I just didn't have enough work, actually. I was sending work off, and I didn't have the ability to create. I have to have a lot of work to go in that. And at the time, I was just mm -hmm. like, you know what? I don't, I don't have enough in the studio to actually be in the show. It was like just a really busy time for me but I think this this coming year if I if they do have it in February or March again I think it might be interesting to to do it because it is like you said it's it's really I think really beneficial to see the people that are there you know year after year it would be I think my sixth my sixth uh, year going in it if I do it this coming year I think but yeah. it's I think I'm getting I think I'm getting close to 10 years actually yeah but it seems shocking <laughs> It's a good show to be in because, um, you know, it's one of the only shows in Canada where it's large enough that it can be called an international art fair, basically, you know. Yeah. I think it's important to be in those. So. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, it sounds like you're probably were short of work because you were shipping work off to different galleries across the world, right? Not just across yeah, the country. Yeah, I, I have a gallery in Australia. Um, I have two galleries, uh, one in New Orleans and one in uh, Philadelphia. And a couple galleries here in Toronto. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I'm realizing that it'd be nice to have a lot of other galleries, but I'd have to basically duplicate myself <laughs> in order to get yeah. So I would need to clone myself and get another studio in order to take on, a, you know, a few more galleries. So because um, I think it's interesting. A lot of artists are like, oh, I'm going to, you know, reach out to as many galleries as I can. And you realize that that's great, but you have to make sure you have time to, you know, provide work to them, all of them. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. That's, that that is the balance that you have to try and and uh, take care of. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm uh, I'm actually kind of falling on the bad side of that right now because I just part of it is just getting materials, and I think it's just I haven't been as efficient in my painting as I kind of normally would be. So yeah, I'm sort of at that point where I'm just like, okay, I really need to kind of reach out and commit and get some stuff done, <laughs> get, to, get it finished. Next month, I think. Oh you know, try and take care of that and, and make sure everyone has a good supply. And because and, uh, every, every gallery is slightly different, right? 
and uh, their clientele mm -hmm. is slightly different. And I think it's really, it's fun to be able to create work specifically for a certain gallery. Um, I like that. I, I like knowing that it's kind of separated. So, so then. Yeah, no, I yeah. do too. Yeah. And I think it, I, th I agree with you. I think that, that kind of makes it fun. It's also though been a challenge in during the pandemic because there's galleries like for me that normally would sell pretty well and pretty regularly, but of course everything's closed down. And then there's other ones in the U S that are so much more unpredictable and more open. So it's kind of, that's part of the challenge too. I always liked, I don't like to have a lot of work in my studio. That's not destined for somewhere. It just makes me kind of feel, I don't know, claustrophobic yeah. or something, but then you kind of like flip when things turn around so quickly, then you realize you just don't really have enough to feed everybody who needs to be fed. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, how how did you find working um, during uh, when everything was locked down? Um, I, I I like asking people that because um, it was interesting for me because I, I didn't really notice a difference. You know, it was it was continuously busy, and um, I'm hoping for other artists that yeah. it was that for th it was that for them as well. Um, yeah, I was I was really busy. Like I think it was it's interesting to me that it became obvious that all those you know, 10, 13 years of doing outdoor shows and building and nurturing your relationships really came back to roost when people, when the pandemic hit, because people wanted commissions. I did a lot of commissions and stuff. I think for me, the biggest challenge was that being an extrovert, I don't really love to be in my studio all the time by myself. And I really miss the energy of other people, which then started to affect the work. So I just felt I, at the beginning, I just wasn't as productive i didn't have the right mindset and the energy to kind of put into the work for right, a while right. yeah. and i was really sick actually i had pneumonia at the beginning of 2019 and that took me a long time to get over like i was shocked wow. so wow yeah yeah it was it was an interesting time but you know knock on wood it was it's been really good and um yeah i'm i'm thankful definitely for yeah yeah, no, I, I think that for me, it was actually a good, probably a good thing. Like you were saying, some of those hard things we were talking about earlier, actually look back and realize they're good. And I think I was, I was moving just a little bit too fast and spread a little bit too thin. So it did allow me to kind of pull back and really think about, you know, what I want to do and where I want right. to go. So I think that was good. I had the opportunity to basically live up at the cottage, which I normally never would have had through the winter, which was quite phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and really seeing the earth change I've really loved but one of the reasons I started talking to artists because I'm like well I'm kind of lonely I want to go and talk to people I don't know so <laughs> let's do I this think <laughs> I think that it it really allows people to you know get some insight on on other artists and for clients as well you know for them to drop in and you know rather than calling the artist directly they get you know a little bit of a, a heads up on you know what that artist is yeah I think it's really good well it's been interesting yeah because the artists of course are looking for some of those you know inspiration and business tips and how you know how you manage your galleries and things like that but I've had a number of uh of kind of responses back from collectors that have been really interested in starting to get a real understanding of what it's like to be a full-time artist and it's not just the oh yeah I'm doing my hobby going painting every day like there's a lot of men there's a lot of work around there's a lot of angst around it and I think that that's really helped them to sort of appreciate, I think, the work in a bit of a different way, which has been pretty yeah, cool. No, it's, gosh, I, I feel it's more than, much more than a full-time job when you take it yeah. uh, social media and advertising and um, emails and um, website updates and mailings. And, you know, it, it, it's much more than a full-time job, and I don't think people realize that. Yeah, well, it's interesting because the last couple of artists that have been on talking to artists, you know, you get to a certain level where, like you were saying, you just, you can't really build your business anymore because you can't, you can only do so much as one person. Um, but the kind of the whole thought of, you know, like, I think it might be time to consider having a studio manager to be able to outsource some of those jobs that the artist, you know, as an artist, you can, you can only do certain things, right? Only you can paint. <laughs> but someone else can probably do your shipping. <laughs> Maybe. Sorry, I lost. Yeah. Sorry, I lost your sound there oh, for a bit. I said maybe, maybe in a couple of years that would be great for me. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'd look. yeah, yeah. I did. I'm just dreaming. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about being able to have one. <laughs> 
I would just so love to have someone else do all my shipping and packing for me. The morning I had to package up a couple of paintings and um, of course it was pouring rain and it was just a nightmare, but you got to do it, you know, you do it. And how do you, and how do you ship your stuff to Australia? Cause that's probably about as far away as you I roll can get. It. I'm fortunate oh, enough okay. that they, they frame my work once it gets there. So that's a huge bonus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's super yeah. easy, you know, so. Because that's what I'm finding, too. I've sent a bunch of things to, um, I mean, just to Maine, so it's not that far away, but, uh, like, a couple of pieces have got damaged, and because they're resin, they're really oh. hard for someone else to fix, and it's just like, oh, all that time and energy, you finally get something in someone's hands that they've been waiting for, they've got a space on their wall, and then it's damaged. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of heartbreaking. I think uh, a mailing work has to be the worst thing because until you actually see that it's been delivered, you know, you're on pins and needles the entire time. I absolutely hate it. I'm looking at yeah. every, every day, just double checking and looking for those exceptions, right? But it's, yeah. that's a bit nerve wracking, definitely, especially when it's a larger piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know I tried to work on canvas because I'm like, oh, yeah, the thought of being able to just roll it up sounds pretty amazing, uh, which, of course, you can't do with panel and you certainly can't do with resin, but I haven't really quite been able to figure out. I've had some successful ones, but not predictably successful, yeah. which is, so I'm still kind of playing Definitely. with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm fortunate to have, you know, a gallery that likes me to roll it, that's for sure. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> So I think we're almost out of time because I know that you have to got to leave a little bit early today. So I, I absolutely appreciate uh, you being uh, taking your time to talk yeah, to no, us. I, but I always like well, to, I always like to end my interviews with if time and money and everything were no issue at all, what would your big hairy ass goal be? Probably to buy a building with nothing in it and then spend quite a fortune on some supplies and just kind of hang out for a while. That's what I'd like to do. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's a good goal. <laughs> so why don't you just uh, share everybody with your website, your Instagram handle, so everyone knows how to get a hold uh, of you. Yeah. Uh, so Instagram is at Ramona Nordell, and my website is www.ramonanordell.com. So very easy, and I think I'll put the website in the uh, in the notes Great. as well. So. Thank you very much. I've really loved, uh, loved chatting with you and I look forward to seeing uh, your Truman Capote or David Bowie iteration. I'll have to follow you on Instagram, which I already do. But. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thanks. We'll talk to you later. Bye. So hopefully we will see uh, Ramona at the Artist Project because that's probably where the next place where we both will be. Um, thank you so much for, for joining me. As always, if there's an artist that you're interested in that you'd like to like me to reach out and see if they'll be interested in being on Talking to Artists, then uh, shoot me an email or a DM. That'd be cool. Uh, coming up next is James Patterson, who yeah, does his prayer machines, kinetic sculptures that are super fun and super happy. So I think you'll definitely want to kind of um, join me for that one. After that, we have Richard Sturgeon, who um, creates these very beautiful organic uh, metal sculptures. Um, and so that's, again, something a little bit different than, um, than what we listened to today in the last couple of weeks. So that's always great. So again, Talking to Artists is uh, every Thursday at 11 o'clock. Uh, you can see past episodes on my Instagram uh, channel on IGTV, as well as my Facebook page. They are also on uh, youtube.com slash Kate Terrell Art. So if you can subscribe, that would be super cool. And I am up to about 17 episodes um, on my podcast. I think I just updated um, Sage's uh, inter interview as well, so that you can kind of listen on the go in any place you get your podcast. Thank you so much. And I look forward to chatting with you next week.